Hi, everybody. You're listening to the Oneness Junkie podcast, hosted by me, Lydia Smith, a self-proclaimed Oneness Junkie. Oneness Junkie is a place to be inspired, encouraged, and supported. Learn from the individuals who are working to make the world a better place. Let's meet today's guest. Hello, everyone. It's Lydia with the Oneness Junkie podcast and YouTube channel. And today we're going to have a very interesting conversation. First, let me introduce y'all to who I'm sitting with. I'm here with Andrew McNevin. Hi, Andrew. Hello, Lydia. Uh, I'm sorry. Is it Lydia? Lydia? Yeah, Lydia. It's Lydia. Lydia. Yeah. Lydia, I'm I'm just like my dad. We're very terrible with names. So sorry about that. <laughs> hey, that's okay. I might I might say something off too, so no problem. Um, so Andrew has a podcast called Journey Through the Pantheo, My Journey Through the Pantheos. And we're I have to warn y'all that this conversation, we were just discussing it. It might be a little controversial. So I want to put a little disclaimer on here that this is for entertainment purposes only. That's the first thing. We're not giving any advice or any medical advice or anything like that. We're also just sharing experiences that we're discussing. And on another note, I want to just mention that the Oneness Junkie podcast was created to help bring um, a highlight of people who are using their time and talents to make the world a, po- a better place. And in order to do that, that's going to create more compassion and love in the world. And that's where Andrew and I are intersecting. But we're going to talk about where Andrew came from and what where he is now and how his um, podcast is doing that to help bring more awareness to the globe about being on an international scale, you're bringing it to the globe. So let me just mention one more thing, which is that we believe here, my podcast, I believe in free will. So you have the right to believe how you want to believe. You have the right to worship whoever you want to worship. And you have the right to listen to this podcast or not. So at any time, if the podcast isn't working for you, the episode's not working for you, it's okay. Everybody's going to align and resonate with different things out in the world. And so we're just putting it out there. We're having a fun, interactive discussion of things that I've never experienced before. So it's about curiosity and openness. And I have to say that me living my life with a sense of curiosity and openness has served me very well. So I hope that you're open to just hearing about somebody else's experience in a, in a form of curiosity and just, just exploring adventures through podcasting to see what you might not know out there in the world, right? <laughs> Perfectly put. Yep. Is, is, that a, is that enough of a disclaimer for y'all? Okay. So Andrew, let me start off. I want to tell everyone how I know you, first of all, and then I'm going to let you introduce yourself because my audience is used to kind of my format. So okay. we're in, we're in Houston and uh, we're part of a community. It's a podcast community. And I know ne- I've been to like three meetings in five years. I mean, I hardly ever go, but I went, I usually go at the end of the year. And so I went in December And uh, Andrew was there and he was, we went around the room and shared something about where our goals or something. And he shared about this similar experience we're going to talk about today. And he, I found out he's never been on a podcast before, even though he has his own podcast, he's never been a guest. So it's like, I raised my hand. I go, I'll have you as a guest. Cause I just thought that was so interesting what he was talking about. So that's how he's here. But subsequently from our conversations, we, but we learned that we both went to the same university. So we're alumni of the same university. So that's special in itself. We have something in common. And although I will, you'll learn from our discussion that he has gone through a different journey to get to the point of understanding oneness than I did, which was a completely different set of circumstances and experiences What's beautiful about this conversation is that we are both at the same place of understanding now, and we may still have our differences of how we choose to 
believe or understand, but it doesn't matter because we both believe in like our connection at the level of this oneness. So I said, it's perfect that your first podcast is on the oneness junkie podcast. Absolutely. Yep. <laughs> so welcome. Thank Andrew. you. Yeah. Oh my God. No, you, will you um, introduce yourself? And I gave Andrew the option to go back as far as he wanted to, anything he wanted to share that could help bring us up to the point of where we're going to be discussing his journey today. So take it away, Andrew. Yeah. So, uh, so my name's Andrew. Um, we already said my, my, my last name and I have, I have thrown it out there a few, a couple times in my podcast. I don't like uh, fragrant, uh, fragrantly throwing it out too much because it is slightly controversial, this, this subject matter, even though it, it, it shouldn't be. And the reason I say it shouldn't be, I mean, I'm just going to go flat out and say it now. Um, my story is not unlike, uh, gosh, thousands upon thousands of people, tens of thousands, possibly millions over the course of human history of people who have either discovered God or discovered, uh, you know, unity and oneness with the universe and such, uh, via psychedelics. Right. So, um, that, doesn't make my story necessarily unique per se, but I do think that in the, in these kind of modern times in a Western culture kind of thing that, um, you know, discovering the, you know, discovering God through psychedelics is a, is a very a big deal. Right. And so um, it, it's slightly controversial, you know, and so the, the, for two and a half years now, I've kind of been trying to kind of be under wraps about it. Right. And um, it's, and it's you're kind of, coming out of the closet. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Absolutely. And well, so are you, are you going to take us back to how you were so in the darkness before you yes. found this? Okay. Cause I want them to know where you were living before you oh, had the experience of God. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. But um, before I move on to that, just, just kind of um, covering the uh, controversial side of this is that it's becoming mainstream. Uh, there, there are a lot of people um like, you know, war veterans is, is a great example of this people with extreme PTSD. And then the, you know, the, the fallout of that being, you know, addiction and depression and stuff like that, who are changing and saving their lives via uh, just to name one psychedelic in particular, ayahuasca, which is a big, uh, you know, big thing right now in the veteran community. And, you know, the likes of Dan Crenshaw and uh, AOC, uh, that they're reaching across party lines and they're, uh, you, know, you know, putting forth these bills and stuff that are going to make it legal and stuff like that for, for veterans to receive this uh, plant medicine is what they call it. Can I, so, add, can I add something right there real quick? Yes. I, just, I want everyone to know that I took a, a mushroom course with an expert last year in January. And we talked about the edible kind you find in the grocery store, the, the bell mushrooms all the way through to the psychedelics and what they do for people and how they help people. So this is not an uncomfortable conversation for me to have with Andrew, because I've already done study with it because I believe everyone should find healing in their life. However, that can show up for them. So let me just, I wanted to add that. So yeah. everyone knows that I have a background and study in this too. So that again, perfectly put. And um, I mean, we, we talk about it being controversial right now. I firmly believe in, in as little as five years, it's going to be so commonplace um, because they're starting to use it in modern, modern day psychiatry now to treat depression, addiction, all those right versus it, drugs. Yeah. Yeah. Any, any, you know, affliction that you can name basically is um, it has an 80% cure rate. And that uh, those that eighty percent of people when I say cured, it's like they're cured for life. Like it's 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 like you 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 take six hours out of your day to do a psychedelic kind of kind of thing, and any affliction that you had, it's cured for life basically within six hours. Right, and again, this is this podcast is for inter entertainment purposes, so yes. we don't want anyone to think that we're telling y'all to get off your medications or anything. So we're gonna skirt over those kinds of dialogues. But yes, uh, yeah. studies have shown that there's been some cures out there. So we'll just be very general. Yeah. About that. I don't want to get and, flagged for saying something. Oh, that yeah. We're not and, backing. Uh, so therapy and then other like SSRI medication or something like that. Th I mean, therapy should be one of the pillars, 
for sure. I mean, uh, for someone who's gone through uh, extreme kind of stuff, I, I, I'm not even saying consider consider this right, but it is an option. Uh, for me, it was it was an option. And so, uh, getting started with kind of my story is, yeah. you know, I I, I didn't have a, a, a bad upbringing or anything like that. And it's not one of these uh, stories where I have like severe traumatic PTSD or whatever. I had a great family, great family upbringing, but regardless of that throughout my life, I've had the tug and the pull of, uh, you know, severe depression and addiction. Wait, and, did you go to church growing up? Were you in church? Yes. So, uh, you know, so I was atheist for 27 years of my life. I don't consider the first 10 years of my life because I really don't feel like children really think deeply about that kind of stuff. I think they just kind of mimic what their parents do uh, more or less. I mean, there are some kids that are deeper than others. Don't get me wrong, but I was definitely kind of go with the flow kind of, yeah, uh, you were just showing up and uh, yeah. those are the formidable years where they're trying to teach you, you should be going to church. Absolutely. So if someone were to ask me first 10 years of my life, Hey, do I believe in God? I'd be like, uh, yeah, I, I guess. Yeah. Do you believe in Jesus? Yeah. Yeah, of course I do. You know? Um, but the more that my brain and intellect started to develop, um, especially when I started to get into the high school years and the first time I picked up a science book about the cosmos and stuff. It's like the more you dive into that, the more you kind of see answers that doesn't necess necessitate a God, you know? Um, by the time I'm in college, I'm, I'm, you know, reading stuff about how the universe was created from a quantum fluctuation and that the um, law of conservation of energy made it to where this, all that energy cancels itself out. And so the, the so it's like, the universe basically over trillions of years of creating virtual particles that annihilate each other. Like one of those particles is going to have just a little bit of an imbalance to create the rest of the universe. It's like, God doesn't need to be a part of this. And so, you know, I went down through a dark, you know, so I've already have, I've already been saddled with basically generational uh, depression and along with that addiction. And so once you couple that with, you read, you literally read something in a book that basically said there is no need for a God in this equation for this all to work. You really start to kind of go down a rabbit hole of nihilism. And that was really the start is, is it was a basically a 20, a 20 plus year kind of just spiral downward of nihilism and atheism. And I would teeter sometimes into agnostic, uh, you know, being ag agnostic, because if you really think about it, well, you can tell me that it's a quantum fluctuation all day long, but what started the quantum fluctuation? And so wait, wait, wait. can I ask you to define for people who haven't maybe heard the terms nihilism? And then of course, the difference between like atheism, you know, just yes, okay, just define it for any listener who this is completely new conversation. Absolutely. So uh, nihilism, stems from atheism uh so atheism of course is you, you don't believe god is real the, he doesn't exist uh the universe is an accident essentially um and uh, all of the things that spill out from the creation or, or the formation the spontaneous formation of the universe anything that spills out of that is just a a machine basically so there's nothing special and this is where we start to get into nihilism so once you look at stuff from that viewpoint, it's like anything that spells that spills out of that accident of the formation of the universe. I'm going to stop short of saying creation because that that implies something created it. So the the spontaneous accidental formation of the universe, anything that spills out after that is a, is just basically a machine. So there's nothing special about human beings and all the biochemistry therein. It's just biochemistry. We're just a bag of particles reacting to each other. And uh, a nihilist would look at a human being standing on a pile of dirt and say, there is nothing more special about that human being than the dirt that they're standing on. It's just an, an accumulation of subatomic particles. And this one may just ha be having some more uh, chemical reactions than, th than this one, but more positive reactions. <laughs> yeah, there's not there's nothing special here. And then you can extrapolate that out to the human race. You know, it's like, all of humans are worthless. This entire planet is worthless. It's just one of, you know, trillions upon trillions in the observable universe. And then and there's you, no meaning of life, right? No, yeah, no meaning of life. This means absolutely nothing. And so 
it's funny. There's there's a positive that's called positive nihilism, where I, I and I, I I dabbled in this a little bit, but it's a very hard thing to maintain. Positive nihilism is is looking at that fact that life is meaningless, and understanding that we only have a tiny little blip of interrupted nothingness, right? So you were nothing before you were born. And then you're born and you live for like this little blip and then you're nothing again for eternity. So you might as well make the most out of that little blip that you have. And that's a great way to look at it, but it's still nihilism. And when you have no backstop, uh, no safety net of belief in anything, you can only hold on to that positive nihilism for, for about a year. And that's about as much as I, I was able to hold on to that. Um, the year of 2012, that was my year of positive nihilism, but <laughs> I had a little that, bit of light in there, right? Yeah, just a little bit. But other than that, it, it really makes it to where, again, when you have the thought that people are worthless, that's me looking back on that now, I, I seriously am, am getting a little emotional now because it's the complete opposite of that, that I've learned, uh, you know, through baptism by fire. Yeah, yeah, that human beings are the most precious uh, thing you can you can imagine. And when you go into the depths of nihilism to the to the extent that that I was, and you couple that with science, I'll never forget. You know, when I would drive around in traffic, and there would be these traffic jams, and I'm just looking at all the people and all the cars polluting the planet and stuff, and and all this stuff. I mean, I'm not saying that, uh, inv- you know. Um, environmentalism is, yeah yeah it's like we need to look after the planet and stuff but when i would look at this traffic jam full of people and what we're doing to the planet i would have these thoughts and this this is the most dangerous thought in human history what i'm about to say here okay i would have these thoughts of man the planet would be so much better off if there were just half of the people on this planet it's like and and then here's the scary part i i, I would have thoughts like I don't want people to die, but it w- the, the world would be better off if there were half the people, right? So think about this from, from just a you and me kind of perspective, right? If there were half of the people on the planet, and, and, and again, these are the thoughts that I used to espouse, right? Right. If there were half the people on the planet, there's half of the people com- competing for the same amount of resources, and there's half of, half of the people are competing for your job life would be essentially easier in a sense right and and so again but but that sounds all logical but but never forget what i just said i said again it, it's it almost chokes me like i almost get queasy saying these words it's like i don't want people to die but life would be better if there were uh, half of the people on the I mean, planet i here. think there's a lot of that conversation going on especially with like um what are they called uh like what are those theories called where everybody's like controversial theories i can't think of the word that everyone um is using right now you know that that the people are um hurting the planet so people have feelings of there's too much population or whatever so these it's not so far off to what some people are saying. Oh, conspiracy yeah. theories. Oh, That's yeah. the word. All these conspiracy theories about where things are headed. But yeah. yeah. So anyway, you were in a dark place, basically. We the audience yeah. understands that now. And I don't want to this is a oneness podcast about light and oh, love. So sure. I don't want to focus too much on your darkness, but we're letting everyone know yeah. he was in a very dark place. And so it was so far off from anything that he was even open to oh, you yeah. know, experiencing. How did you, so anyway, I guess get us up to um, where you want to, like what, after you were in the nihilism, you know, what, what, did, what got you to want to try these other ways of, I mean, cause you weren't expecting, were you looking for God? Like why? No, no absolutely not. I will say this though. Um, there were times when I was at the peak of my addiction where I thought that there had, to, there has to be something better than this. You know, it's like, Oh, that's right. You were, yeah, t- yeah you had an addiction. Yeah. But anybody, lots of people have addictions, but mm-hmm. yeah, that's where you went to an addiction yeah. um, level. So, so to pull myself, basically pulling myself out of that 
was things were so bad in that space I was in. And, uh, you know, I'd look at science for answers and I would look at the, to science for beauty and you can find beauty and like the symmetry of things and the beauty of the, the, the beautiful the geometry. Symmetry. Yeah. You can find beauty there, but when it, when it, when it comes to real existential beauty, the, the science really doesn't do it for me, you know, and, and as much as I tried, I couldn't find it. And um, again, so I'm wondering, is there something out there that's, that I can't point to in a science book and say, well, I can explain that it's right here. You know, uh, I can whip out this, I can point to this. And if I can't do it, then I can point to this like super smart professor over here that with these equations that can do it, you know? And wait, so, wait, let me ask you, were you um, looking for a change in your addiction? Were you trying to stop your addiction? Y yes, but there, there, there was a catalyst for that. And that, oh, catalyst, okay. that catalyst is, is my, awesome, just amazing wife right now. Okay. Um, I met her at a time in my life where again, it was, it was kind of the lowest that I've been. And she was this beacon of, of just brilliant light, just shining through all that darkness. And I, I thought to myself, Ooh, I can't mess this up. Um, I, I had been to years and years, decades of, of therapy. I'd been on the SSRI medications like Prozac and effect, you know, all the stuff, right. All the SSRI and stuff. All the talk therapy. Yeah. All the talk therapy. And the thing is, is you can hide stuff from a therapist, right? You can not, you know, say the whole truth or, or leave out parts intentionally to make yourself look better and stuff. And you can hide it from yourself too. Absolutely. Like you're not even admitting your own truth, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. You can build a giant story of cognitive dissonance around your own uh, hypocrisy and turn it into this elaborate story where you're not the person you're at not all the victim or yeah. anything yeah and so and so i was doing that you know basically for you know 30 years or so and um again i met uh, during my uh, during my divorce um i was you know dating a lot of people and there was this one person that that i was dating and the more I got to know her, it was, it was like, there's something incredibly special about this person that I couldn't deny. And I'd never seen something like it before. And there's just this pureness uh, to her and, and this loving nature of every, every the, the way I look at it. And I know we're not supposed to, you know, judge others based on others or whatever, but <laughs> what, what I saw one day is um, I'll never forget my, my she, um, had an ACL surgery. And this is right when we were first dating. And uh, she asked me, she's like, Hey, I can't move anywhere. I can't move. I'm, I'm literally couch bound while I got this thing hooked up to my leg. And uh, would you want to come over? I was like, yeah, sure. So I come over and I'm not joking around while I was over there for just about two, three hours, probably 30 people cycled through her house, giving her gifts. Like someone came over and washed her hair and stuff. And, and as these people are coming in, I'm talking to them and they are just the most awesome people. And I'm like, so all of these awesome people love this person enough to where they're coming over and washing her. And I'm serving, sitting there. And they're serving her, service yeah. to others. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm, so I'm sitting there. I'm like, what is it about this? And so I, 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 the more and more I got to know her, I was like, okay, this person is awesome. And this person likes me for some reason. And I was like, ooh, I can't mess this up. I cannot mess this up. And so I, I got online and I said, how do, how does someone um, help themselves? How does someone cure um, themselves of, of, of addiction and depression and stuff like this? And I, and again, I, we're not supposed to give advice here and stuff, but um, I would say just do your research and, and there are uh, legal and safe ways of doing what I'm about to say here. Uh, one of the, one of the very first things that leapt out at me, it's like, a lot of podcasts and stuff are, um, are talking about ayahuasca, which yeah, like is like how to get out of an addiction. Yes. And so ayahuasca is the second most powerful psychedelic known to man, uh, or is it the third? I think it's like the third. Um, it's like the third most powerful psychedelic known to man. And basically uh, it, it, it works differently with everyone, but it's, it basically goes like either you do it once or you do it a handful of times or some number therein, and it'll basically set you on the, it will, the way I explain it to people is ayahuasca slams you down really hard on the right path. Now, 
being slammed down on the on the right path is not the path though navigating the path is is the path so you can be slammed down on a path really hard but you can you know just go back into your regular life it's a, but what i what i would say is that ayahuasca psychedelics in general cuz uh, mushrooms are a part of this as well is again they slam you down really hard and they show you this is the path and so that's the kind of the feedback I got when I was researching it is like, oh, wow. Okay. I've, I'd never done anything like that before in my life. I, I was, I was a drinker, you know, but, um, I never even did like marijuana or something like that. It's especially <laughs> not psychedelics. You went yeah. from zero to ayahuasca. Yeah. And so I researched it and, and it was one of those things where I usually would, would be too chicken to to go in on something like this because you read some accounts about some of the bad experiences on yeah. psychedelic and it's it's some terrifying stuff and so I was like man do I risk the 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 scary stuff and I don't know there was something in me that that said it's now or never like it's it's like you gotta you gotta pull the trigger on this it's like well you, you had an internal guidance yes and so absolutely so it was like I was obsessed about getting better. Um, my addiction had turned into a new form of addiction, which was get better. And so I was obsessed about it. I, I, I went about it, of course, the legal way. I highly recommend anyone who is, who, who is considered, first of all, let me just, <laughs> let me just say a couple things. If, if anyone has any ideas about doing this kind of stuff, let, listen to these words very carefully. Only do it if you need it, straight up. Someone like me needed it. Um, if you are doing it because you're curious, forget it, okay? It's not fun. It really is not fun. Um, it's it, not it, something to play with, in other exactly, words. Exactly, exactly. You, it's, it's not a game. Um, it, it's like, do it if you are desperate. Like, if, you, if you're, if it's, if there's no other option, right. Do. If your choice is I'm dying anyway. Yeah, exactly. Or, or yep. could it, if I'm at the bottom, yep. If there's only up. <laughs> yep, exactly. Maybe or, that's a decision make criteria. Yeah. Or if, if, if you're like literally nothing else has worked, um, that was my case. I wasn't necessarily like, you know, like, you know, at the point where I was like, I'm going to die anyway, kind of thing to me, it was, I had had some thoughts in the past about that kind of stuff, but for me, it was more like nothing that I've ever done has ever worked. And I, I'd been at it for a, a, a good, I mean, granted, I, I wasn't trying hard before, but um, nothing worked. And so, again, just y'all listen to my voice. Only do it if you need it. And, and just remember that if you're doing it for the right reasons, that it's it's not fun. This is not when people hear about psychedelics, they think about the Beatles and they think about like, oh, I had a friend who went to a, a, a Grateful Dead concert and did blah, blah, blah. It's like, no, y'all. No, 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 no. Don't uh, get that out of your head. If you're doing this for the reasons to help yourself and, and, and get better, you better be prepared to, um, I, I mean, I have no other way to, to explain it other than to say that even the beautiful stuff is so cosmically beautiful that it can be terrifying. And imagine, you know, I, I, it's hard to explain. You'd have to listen to my podcast to get to understand. Yeah. What I'm and doing. I just want to add, like, while we're having people listen to this um, again, and I'm really a little nervous about the AI picking up certain words and flagging the conversation, but I want to just say that there are other options. I had a guy on a podcast talk about his experience with that. And then he decided that breath work could get him to the same destination. Yep. So this is not for everyone and it's not something that we're recommending. We're yeah. only talking about Andrew's personal experience and we're not giving advice. So yes. just want to keep reminding everyone of that because it's an important piece of this conversation that he's just sharing what worked for him and he's giving he's giving recommendations to take it seriously. Okay. Yes. Absolutely. There are um, multiple, ultimately what you're trying to reach is a high state of gamma in your brain. Gamma are, are the, they are the most uh, energetic and most powerful uh, brain waves. And regardless, if you get to that state via psychedelics or transcendental meditation or 
other breath stuff, work, breath work. There are no, any number of ways of achieving high, high states, high levels of gamma in your brain. Yeah. Psychedelics is just one There's of them. In less fact. risky ways. Yeah. Far less risky ways. Yeah. Um, and also, um, it, it's like you you want to go in through the front door instead of, instead of <laughs> and you recommend that too don't you yeah I, I again i did this because it's something y'all i didn't believe in any of this stuff uh, so uh meditation i'd laugh at it's, it's like meditation get out of here breath work get out of here i show me well, what's that gonna do yeah it's like show me breath work and meditation in my quantum physics book and then i will say okay maybe i'll try it um someone like me needed to be shown something that they could not explain. Um, yeah. That's exactly why. I, I mean, but anyway, so. Let's go what, into your experience because I yeah. think everyone's curious of what yeah, your absolutely. experiences were. We, so, so we understand how you got there now. And yeah. Now and I just want to stress again. Having the experience. I just want to stress again. I did this all legally. Okay, everybody. So listen, <laughs> that, that's the Thank other you. thing. AI, can you hear that? This is all yeah. legal. So there are ways of, of doing this legally. I, if you're interested, research it. I'm not going to uh, go into it, but there is a way that's protected under the freedom of religion and stuff in this, in this country that um, psychedelics could be um, part of that religion. And again, I'm not going to go in, uh, go in and there. And that's but, how you got it. Okay. Yes. And so uh, the, the first uh, go at this is kind of like a dip your toe in the water kind of, kind of go. And so, yeah, testing. You, yeah, you you start off with a very low dosage of, of ayahuasca just to see how you react and how you feel. Um, the ver the first few times I did it, it was it was nothing really interesting at all. I think the most interesting thing I experienced was I, I opened my phone up and got on Facebook and I saw a video of a tree that was blowing in the wind, and I was like I was like oh that's kind of cool and I went I went past it. <laughs> and then um, the next day, when I, I saw that same uh, post, it wasn't a, it wasn't blowing, it wasn't in, the blowing wind. in the wind. It, yeah, it was a picture of a tree that my friend had it, uh, something. So my friend had posted some picture of a tree for some reason, and I realized the next day that it was he wasn't talking. Yeah, and so, um, <laughs> but that was kind of the extent of my first kind of experiences. And then um, I went in. I don't really consider those to be experiences uh, though, because again, you're just kind of testing to see if it's, if, if an experience is going to be a good one for you or not, when you do enough of it to have an experience, that's when I consider those my, my experiences. And my first experience was just awesome. I can't, the, I definitely experienced uh, stuff in that experience where I couldn't explain it with science and everything like that. Um, now you could still explain all of this away rationally in the sense that of course you're going to see trippy stuff if you take psychedelics, right? It's like, there's nothing magical about this, but anyone who t typically people who say that argument are people who have never done it before. And I can tell you that when you're in the moment and you're experiencing these, these amazing, beautiful, uh, trippy things, it, it's, it's realer than real is what is what it is that's that was the the single most criterion for me that made it stand out as something i should pay attention to because and this is proven scientifically actually is that your brain becomes this giant antenna and receiver um your tiny little sliver of reality that human beings have evolved uh to to experience gets broadened and it gets broadened because Again, the gamma in your brain, which is directly uh, correlated to consciousness, increases. I mean, it shoots through the roof. And when that happens, it blows past uh, these uh, stage gates in your brain that are meant to limit your experience. The stuff like the default mode network, which is your sense of you, the sense of self that gets blown away. And you you go, your brain turns from being able to experience something like a little sliver of reality this big to being to experience. You know, I'm not going to say you see to, all to of being reality. all things like you're part yeah. of all things. Right. And so the Wait, phenomena, you, how long are any of these experiences when you're doing them? Yeah. So they, they're about four to five hours. Okay. Give or take. So it's like a whole day's worth of activity. Yeah. And so my, my first experience was just whiz bang kind of cool stuff. I think it, I think it, 
st stepping back from all of these experiences that I've had, I, I now know that it was basically um, God weaving a a narrative, something to, hey, we're, it's almost as if God built out this lesson plan of like, hey, we can't hit Andrew right off the bat with with really intense philosophical stuff. So let's hit him with something that just looks cool that he can't explain. And then on the next experience, we'll, we'll introduce a little bit more, that kind of thing. So my first experience was just seeing whiz bang, amazing stuff, like uh, going all the way from like unbelievably beautiful to like really creepy. And, and like, so one of the beautiful things I witnessed was uh, this grass, uh, we were at the, um, at, at the beach basically. And um, you know, between the the beach and the beach houses is like this little grassy area and stuff. And it was blowing in the wind. And what I saw there basically was just something unexplainable in a sense. The only way I could explain it is, is like this ancient motherly presence that um, when I saw the grass kind of blowing around, it almost looked like a, a, mother laying down with its uh with a newborn infant and gently caressing that infant um and you and you really did get this motherly motherly presence from it but it was something so ancient and i'm going to hesitate to say the word alien it was alien only in the sense that i've never experienced it before but it was so familiar at the same time it was one of the most beautiful things that i've ever seen and then um then we get into a little bit of the creepy stuff uh, well, actually, before I get there, another beautiful... Not, not too much of the creepy stuff. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But another beautiful thing I saw <laughs> it was... a creepy was... highlight. Oh, yeah, yeah. But another beautiful thing I saw before I move on to that was I was... I never, I'll never forget standing on the edge of the water at the beach and hearing a symphony. Uh, the most gorgeous... Oh. The, the most gorgeous music I've ever heard in my life, but it wasn't music. It was... There was something about the sound of the water... Like People, vibrations, it was like yeah, vibrational the, sound. Every sound that was going on, the, the 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 water, the wind. There were people camping on the beach and them talking and stuff. It all built into this symphonic crescendo, and it was unmistakable music. And I was sitting there just motionless with a tear coming coming down my face because of how beautiful it was. But then you juxtapose that just a mere minute later, and there's someone standing right next to me on, on the beach. And I'll never forget. I looked up at Jupiter and I saw basically like what amounted to like an eye, like a cosmic eye looking at me. And I, th I want to say it even kind of like blinked. And, and I, I remember like pointing up to that and I looked over to the person next to me. I was like, you know, I was like, Hey, did you see? And I turned around and there's no one there. I mean, no one there. It, 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 it was so evident to me that there was a person there you could see them out of the corner of your eye. You could feel their presence. You could even hear sound echo locating off of them to where you, even if you were closing your eyes, you could, you could hear that there's a person next to you just be, by the muffled sound. Everything about my experience was there is a person here. And it was the creepy, one of the creepiest things <laughs> leading up to this. I had much more creepy experiences later, but turning around to tell someone something and they're just not there. That was creepy. Um, there were several other creepy things that happened, but, uh, um, all in all, I was able to ignore that creepiness and kind of chalk it up to it. You know, it is what it is. A lot of people, when they have these experiences, freak out a little bit too easily for me, I would just kind of look at, I looked at it like, Hey, I'm on a ride in Disney world. I signed up for this ride. I'm not going to jump out of the, um, you know, the roller, roller coaster, coaster. Yeah. you know, I'm just going to suck it up and go through the ride. And so, all in all, though, it was a beautiful experience. Um, my second experience, though, is when it got really, is really amazing. Is that the amazing. one you told me about where you experienced God? Yes. Okay, let's so, go there because I want the audience to hear that. Yeah. So, again, my whole goal here is not to see this whiz-bang stuff. My whole goal is healing. And I didn't get that healing on, on that first experience. And so I was like, I'm going to do it again. In fact, I'm going to do double the amount I did the time before. And so I, I went in again and i did this uh it did it this time at my uh, house where i grew up my boyhood home my mom was selling the the property and it was a, this property is it's basically like a sixth family member we just love this place so much but we all gave her our, our blessing and uh every, everything's starting to get moved out and i'm like well i'm gonna have my experience over there because i want to kind of mourn 
this house being sold. And so I'm walking around the property all night on uh, this time it was mushrooms. Um, I'm walking around trying to trigger some kind of emotional reaction and response so I can, so I can mourn and nothing was really happening. I saw some interesting stuff. I saw that same mother earthly presence again. It was really beautiful. And then I saw a couple of creepy things, but stuff I could easily ignore. And, but again, nothing amazing until the very end of the night. Uh, it was like 4.30 in the morning. It was so late, you know, or early, depending on how you look at it. But I was going around turning off lights around the property. And I turned off all the lights in the pool house and stuff. And uh, I, I had to walk across the property to the garage where, the, where our laundry room is. And I went over there and turned the light off in there. And I'll never forget this. Um, to me, all the lights are off in the property. I, I exit the laundry room and I see there's one light that's on. Um, keep in mind, I'm going to, I'm going to cry when, when, I, when I talk about this, it's just so beautiful. Um, keep in mind, I've been going around all over the property, trying to, um, mourn the loss of this property, like try to remember some beautiful memory. And I walk out of the laundry room and I turn left and there's a light on and there's, a, and the light is, it's like a spotlight. It's in a cluster of floodlights and all of one of them are out, um, there's only one that's shining and it, it, is, it looks exactly like a spotlight and the spotlight is shining down on the, on this particular spot of my back porch. And there just so happens to be a piece of, or, or like a, a wicker uh, lawn couch that is facing me perfectly, which it shouldn't be facing me. It should be facing the fence. Like, what is it going to look at, you know, or it should be facing the rest of the property. What is this? The only thing you're going to look at facing my direction is a dang fence. So there's no reason why it should be there, the couch. Um, and, and so the, it's, it's this perfect light shining down. Keep in mind, I'm still atheist at this point. And I'm looking at this light shining down and I'm realizing that it, it, it is on the spot of my most favorite memory I've ever had in my entire life, ever. Um, my, uh, my great uncle, he's my dad's uncle, but we called him, um, I'm going to use a, a pseudonym uh, here. Well, um, it's my uncle Bob. That's not his real name, but I don't want to drag family members into this stuff. Um, my uncle Bob, uh, he was much older. You know, he was my dad's uncle. He would come and visit us. Uh, he lived in Vegas, and he would he would come visit us, and he loved our property. We had a, a lot of acreage, um, and he would every time he would visit us, and a thunderstorm would roll through. He loved thunderstorms, and he loved coffee. And he would, anytime a, a, th a thunderstorm would come through, he would brew up a, a, thing, a pot of coffee and sit right there on that spot of that porch, right in the breeze away, watching the thunderstorm. And first coffee I've ever had in my life was with him on that spot. Thereafter, every time that happened, I would sit down with him and I'd have coffee and watch the thunderstorms. And sometimes we would talk, we would talk about, you know, deep stuff. I mean, even as a little six-year-old kid, it, this happened like from the age of six all the way up to like the age of 12 or 13 or 14 even. And sometimes we would talk these deep things. He was a very philosophical person. Sometimes we would just be quiet and watch the thunderstorm, but it's my favorite memory ever in life ever. And um, it, it's as if the property, this is the, this is the little stupid logic in my head at the time, not knowing that it was God um, in my head. I was thinking, the property somehow knows that this was the spot of my favorite memory ever in life. Any other spot in the entire property could burn for all I care. That's how important that piece of property or that little piece of that property was where the light was perfectly shining down and the couch is facing me, almost beckoning me to come over and sit down on the couch and relive one last little memory in the house with my, with my uncle Bob. And I was thinking to myself, there is, how does first I thought it was the mushrooms. I was like, uh, the mushrooms know, but I, I was at the very <laughs> tail end of the experience and it's not a hallucination. I took a picture of it with my phone. You're looking at a picture of that right there. Uh -huh. That's light. I, I took out my phone and I took a picture of that moment right there. Yeah. And so I'm looking it. at the, I'm looking at the picture. I'm like, that's not a hallucination. That's real. And then I was like, it's not the mushrooms. I was like, somehow this property knows that uh, this is the most, my favorite memory of my entire life. And the more I started thinking about how that's not possible, a, a prop, a piece of property can't understand that. 
I started thinking about, could it be something else? And I'll never forget the, the moment I thought, could it be some kind of divine intervention? You opened to, yourself up to considering there might be something like God. Absolutely. So the very second I had that thought of, could it be something divine? I wasn't even done with that thought when I got hit with a, a wave of infinite love um, that was so potent and so powerful that I couldn't look up at the source. The, it was above me. The source of this love was above me. And I, I remember trying to look up and I couldn't. It was so beautiful that it hurt. It was going to explode my skull and like atomize every subatomic particle in my body at the speed of light. That's how powerful it was. There was so much love that it almost killed me. I felt like I was having a panic attack. Yeah, like and your heart was bursting. Yes, but it wasn't scary. It was it, it, like it was, but it wasn't. I, yeah, you I don't afraid know. Of it. Yeah, I don't know how to explain it. And that was my first God experience. He he basically showed up, and that's it. He showed up and said, in so many words. I mean, there he, there were no words. It was just this like, beautiful. I love you, kind of thing. Yeah, it was this beautiful cosmic grand romantic gesture. I, I told my wife later, it's like, I now know what it's like when women get swept off their feet by this, by these beautifully awesome romantic gestures. And they just, you know, one of them, one I think of is there's a video online of a bride at her wedding. Her dad had died. This is going to make me cry again, talking about this. Her dad had died and all of her uncles and anyone who was a father figure in her life, like went and danced with her separately at the uh, father uh, daughter dance at the wedding. It's stuff like that, where it's something so deeply personal that, you know, no one, you'd had to do a lot of research about me to, to know. I didn't even really remember that that was my favorite spot on the planet until I remembered and saw it. And so you'd had to do so much research on me to, to uh, concoct this romantic gesture, but, that's what it felt like. It felt like the most, someone had done the most research about me. Someone cared about me that much that they researched that much about me. And was they were like, remember this spot? It was so, just unbelievable. Let me ask you, because you were atheist, did you believe it was God? How did you, did God say I'm God? Like, how no. did you know that was God? It was just the, it was just the, the infinite welling uh, and like overflowing of love. You, you felt God, in other words... Uh, yeah, it even was. If you didn't even if your brain didn't want to call it God, you felt that it was God. Oh yeah, I, I basically, yeah, it was, it the was knowing. It was unmistakable. It was it, it. The second I had that thought and got hit with that wave of love, it was just like, yep, there's there. God is real without yeah, a doubt. That's how that. That's how God revealed itself to you was through the feeling of love. Yep. And they say God is love. Let's move to, because look, we're in like 47 oh, wow. minutes. And yeah. let's move into the experience where you wanted to meet God again. Yeah. So second, well, there was there were several other times. I had had I had not had a breakthrough with ayahuasca yet. I had one with mushrooms, but ayahuasca is the the real goal. Uh the communication barrier on ayahuasca versus mushroom mushrooms is different. Um so you want to have a breakthrough on ayahuasca. It's just so much more intense. And um, so I had tried it a couple more times uh, with me moderate success. I had this one absolutely terrifying experience that I won't go into. Um, but it was enough for me to say, oh, it's 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 not a joke. Like if you're getting into this, it's it's go time. Right. So. I had that terrifying experience. It took me a couple months before I had the courage to do it again. And I did it again. And it was right in here. It was right, right back uh, on this floor right here where I'm sitting. Um, I, I had a, this amazing experience. You always had to kind of go through some kind of um, uh, barrier essentially to entry. There, there are barriers to entry to your uh, amazing experience on, on this stuff. And it's, it's usually, you know, you, you feel like you're going to die. There's no easy way to say it. Um, that's why I say this stuff, y'all, you, you need to do it only if you truly need it. Um, because the only way that it works is, is if you really do feel like you're going to die. It's not like 
you remember in the moment, like, oh, I took psychedelics and this is a figurative death. It's not a real one. It's like, no, the only way that this works is if you really do think you're going to die. And so I had this terrifying moment that I'm not going to get into back here <laughs> um, where it, it was it. it. It was like, oh, that's it. Um, I don't, I don't, I, I remember thinking, I can't believe I got myself into this. Why, why did I do this? This is the stupidest thing ever. And I survived it. Uh, my wife actually came in and gave me a blanket because, uh, I, I was yelling at one point, like I'm freezing or something. I, I forget exactly how it worked, but she came in and gave me a blanket and something about that gesture rescued me. It's like someone giving, showing you love in that moment, wanting to help you rescued me. And I, I got pulled out of that. And I was incredibly thankful because I survived it. You, you do all this research about it, and you know that you're going to have this figurative death. Uh, they call it ego death and stuff, all that stuff, even though I have a, an opinion about ego death per se, but I'm not going to get into that now. Um, regardless, I survived it, and I was so thrilled. I was like, I, I kept saying, oh, I'm better. I'm, I've been cured. I'm, I was jumping for joy practically. And God was kind of up here in the corner of the room, in the top corner, impossible to describe what what god looked like other than it was it was light and geometry that was otherworldly it's not something that you could draw or you know put into a computer even but it was this beautiful otherworldly geometry and love it's, it was just light geometry and love uh and and really unflinching just you know uncompromising love and you and you wanted to have that experience again, so you did it again to get to that point, right? Yeah, and so I thought that was it, and so I was like, okay, experience over. And it's hilarious. Um, I, I looked God in the face, basically. I mean, he didn't doesn't have a face, and I and I say he, it's not a he, it's a it's a we, <laughs> it's yeah, <laughs> it's it's all genders that you can imagine and more. I mean, like it's um, everything. God is everything. There is no gender with God, but he does exude feminine and masculine qualities at different times and sometimes combined. But um, I thought it was it. And I remember looking at God and saying, Hey, thank you. I'm cured. Your job is done, <laughs> which is hilarious to, to say to God. And so I went into the bathroom back here because one of the other things that you, people should be warned about with psychedelics is that uh, the side effects are, you know, gastrointestinal um, side effects. I'll just leave it at that. And so I went to the restroom and I'm in there and God just pops up. He just enters the room and proceeds to have a two and a half hour conversation with me in English, uh, the likes of which are so cosmically amazing. And, uh, and I say English, it's not like you and I talking here, but it practically was. I mean, the communication was in thought. I was speaking in English, but it was talking back to me in thought, but the thought right. was so but you were crystal. able to translate it so you could understand it in English. Yeah. The, and the thought was so crystal clear that it might as well have been English. Right. And it was doing stuff like he knew I loved jokes. And so he, he was cracking jokes with me and these cosmic jokes. And, and then sometimes <laughs> using me as, as a, as a puppet to, to deliver the punchline. Like there was one where, he basically said, we were talking about the subject of evil, and he said, hey, don't don't use your intellect to try to understand what evil is. He's like, you'll never understand it. Uh, leave that to me. And I was like, I was like, okay, um, I won't do that. Uh, I'll, I'll leave it up to you. I get it. It's, it's outside of my intellect. But I was like, but wait a second. I do. And then like he... It's, it's this long... Like uh, a banter? Y'all had banter? We, we had this banter, and he ultimately... It's a long story. You'd have to go listen to that episode on my podcast. It's called Trip Number Five, The Answer. But there's this back and forth <laughs> cosmic joke about why I can't dive into. I started. It's it's a long story, but he actually used me as a as a puppet, almost like a marionette, to drive home a punchline, and it was unbelievable. So we were cracking jokes, and then at the peak of the, and then I, I was laughing so hard. And God kept jabbing me with that punchline over and over and to make me laugh even harder. And it was as if I was being like held down and tickled by God. Like imagine being tortured, like tickle torture, you know, by God. And so I actually had to yell at God. I was like, stop, I'm trying to get catharsis here. Like I'm trying to 
I can't sit here and just laugh and, and, and pee myself out of, out of just sheer, you know, joy, tickle, tickle torture and joy here. I was like, can we, can we focus? And then he hit me yeah. with stuff that was so cosmically. Is, is this when you were asking the 16 questions? Oh no, that's, that, that was an experience. So this experience I'm talking about here was about through two and a half years ago that that one i i told you about with the 16 questions that was last year that was last february okay because i think what i want to focus on is not like the details of yeah what you were physically doing like in the restroom or whatever what i'd like for the audience to understand is i want them to walk away from this podcast and they feel like they got some information about what your overall analysis is of the experiences that you've had. So can you go to the conversation around you decided you wanted to have another encounter with God. You wanted to ask God, you had all these questions that you were going to ask like the meaning of life or whatever, and tell them about that experience. And then like, I want, while we're wrapping it up, because look, Mm -hmm. it's 55 minutes. Oh wow! I want them to understand where you came to, because the whole point of this, having you on the episode was to show people that you didn't even believe in God. You had an experience of God and what God has shown you has helped you to live your life today with such appreciation and gratitude and like reverence for Mm -hmm. our life existence. Cause I want to focus on the positive outcome rather than the details. Absolutely. Um, so I, I had several, uh, when I say several experiences, I'm, I'm up to gosh, I think like a dozen experiences. Now people ask me why I keep going in is because th- th- you're left with these cliffhangers where the, the answer to your riddle is going to be on the next episode, basically. So I, I, I've, I've been, you know, I've had a lot of experiences and uh, over well, the course- and to be careful too, because you don't want your, other addiction to shift into an ayahuasca addiction with God, you know, yeah. you have yeah. to be careful with that. Well, I did tell my therapist cause I saw him, I saw his gears turning when I started talking about this stuff and I was like, let me cut you off. But you're, you're going to tell me that I have replaced my uh, previous addiction with it, with an addiction to God. Right. And he was like, yeah. And I was like, what a better ad- addiction to have. And he kind of <laughs> shut up. And it's, 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 which is kind of where oneness junkie name came from. Like yeah. if you're going to be into anything, a junkie of anything, why not be a junkie of oneness? Yeah. And, and I'll, I'll put, I'll, I'll say this, like psychedelics are not addictive, but you can become addicted to the beauty and unbelievably life-changing. It's kind of like, it's, but again, as intense as they are. I mean, they're incredibly intense. It's like getting in the ring with Mike Tyson, right? But let's imagine that you got into the ring with Mike Tyson and were able to hold your own. You took a whole bunch of shots, right? And they were brutal, but you held your own. It, that that experience is still thrilling. And so you can get addicted to the experience, but right. not it's not an addictive substance. But Okay, take us so to I will the say, question one. Yeah, so I will say over the course of the dozen or so times, here's my idea of not only stuff that has been told to me, but also stuff that was integrated thereafter and and stuff where you get validations via synchronicity and stuff of like, hey, that was legit real. Like my takeaways from that experience and what I saw was was real. Um, It's not only stuff that you get on psychedelic experiences, it's the integration, waking, sober, light of day thereafter kind of synchronicities that- Awarenesses, yeah. Yeah, that reinforce what you learn. And so I will say over the course of all of this, the, the through line, the through line is number one, God is definitely real. Um, a lot of people have a lot of issues with God in particular. It's like, why does God allow for suffering? Right. Very easy answer to that. Actually, in order for God to have created anything, he needed to pr- uh, put limitations on it. So if God was going to to use the biblical term like speak something into existence if he spoke perfection into existence if he spoke infinity which is him if he spoke infinity that's a non-transaction infinity plus infinity is infinity he would just it's just more of himself and it's like a this is like nothing happened there so in order for something to become tangible he had to to put limitations on it 
and, and using this analogy of the spoken word is, is quite uh, pertinent because what is a word? A word is an, uh, an, an imperfect container for thought. So you have the perfect form in your head of the thought that you're trying to convey, and then you cram it into this container called a word that is imperfect. And you hope that the person on the other end that's unpacking that word has the same thought in your head, but you know there's a disconnect, there's a point of failure here. So everything in existence became that. It became this imperfect container for a, an otherwise perfect form. Um, and and it, it, there, therein lies this, this problem that we have of, of why does evil exist and stuff like this? Why do bad things happen and stuff? It's because, because of that inherent imperfection. It needed to take, the only way it could take existence is if it was imperfect. And you look at stuff like beauty, for example, uh, beauty is, is really imperfect. It's like there has to be limitations on something for it to be beautiful. Think about, think about a, a band that's playing this beautiful song. They, they're playing on a beat. They're playing in syncopation. They're playing on key. This is restriction. This is not freedom. This is restriction. Beauty, if you really think about what it is, the, the embodiment of what it should be, it shouldn't be restricted. It should be free. But because it's limited to this thing, um, it is what it is. Same thing with uh, with free, you could think about this, the problems that we face with free will and, and, the, and the like. Um, basically, what I've come to determine is that free will is one of the biggest problems in this whole equation. Predeterminism, from what I've gathered, is real. How else do you explain synchronicity? How else do you explain these cosmic synchronicities that happened on psychedelics and stuff? All psychedelics really does is point out that everything is a, is a giant synchronicity. A psychedelic experience is just a whiz-bang, theatrical, grandiose synchronicity. And it shows you that everything is that. And when you come out of the psychedelic experience and you go into the waking light of day, you see that the synchronicities that happen therein are just more of these synchronicities, right? But the only way that synchronicity can be real is if, is if predeterminism is real. But then free will is also a very important factor of this. And so what I've ascertained from my experience is that there can be both. There's, who is it that wrote that there is a difference between predeterminism and free will? Show me that person and I will show you someone with a closed mind. I think based on what I've experienced and seen and was kind of communicated to by God, is that they're one and the same. In fact, when I specifically asked God, hey, how does predeterminism and free will square up? God told me, I am free will. Words straight from his quote unquote, quote unquote mouth. He said, <laughs> he said, I am free will. And so you start to ask yourself, okay, on that experience, I was told that our natural homing mechanism is, is towards him. If we were born into a vacuum with no, no nothing that can harm us, we are, we would be born in, innocent and untainted and our will would be his. But the very second that we draw breath and have to compete to survive, we have to shake hands with something that you would call evil, quote unquote. And therein lies the other part of this equation is to, to live, we have to engage in some degree of kind of threat, uh, cutthroat tactics in order to survive. And that becomes the other part of Again, anything good you see in the world is, is God's will. That's our will. We share in his will. Anything bad you see in the world is not your will. It's not God's will. It's, it's another cosmic force that's competing for your will, essentially. And it, it overtakes your will and makes you do stuff against your will. And so it, it really... It, now, this could be a giant game of cognitive dissonance for me, uh, someone who is... Uh, a recovering addict that has done terrible things in their life and is trying to build a justification for this stuff. This is a great story to tell oneself of like, Hey, it's not you that did these bad things. It's the, it's the force of evil that overtook your free will. But God showed me over and over again on multiple experiences that that is in fact the case. Um, and so that's kind of the full picture is, is, is God is real. This universe is an illusion that's actually been proven in science. The Nobel prize for, uh, for 2022 for physics proved that this universe is an illusion. Um, everything is basically a, a quantum conscious hologram and it's God. We, you could call it, you could say that we're living in the mind of God. You could say that we're living in the, in a dream of God, but 
this is all part of it. And, and, and when God created us and he created limitations on us, and I know I'm all over the map here and I apologize, but <laughs> when, it, when he put limitations on us, he created something that he didn't expect. Um, for example, we experience the beauty of discovery. He doesn't. God knows everything. If he's infinite, infinitely powerful, infinitely smart, he knows everything, right? So we get to, he gets to experience the beauty of discovery through us. And, and he built into our being a similar, a similar kind of way to experience this. When we have children, it's like when you're an adult, you're kind of, you look at all these daily stuff and you're, you're, you're so acclimated to it. You don't process it anymore. It's just it's commonplace and, and just boring. But when you have a child, you get to see how amazing everything is. You get to see them see a sunset for the first time. And you're like, wow, that is truly amazing. Same concept with God. Um, we are, he is, we are the organs of experience for him. Same thing with courage. God is infinitely powerful. It can't be threatened or harmed or killed. What use does God have of courage, right? He experiences courage through us because we're inherently limited. And the riddle of this is that uh, death is the thing that we're ultimately trying to be courageous against. And we really shouldn't be because death is, is the most beautiful thing you can possibly imagine. Once you've seen the other side, you'll understand that, you know, I'm sure that you understand this, but for anyone who's doubting that, um, death is just, it's just the, the, the threshold that you walk across to get to the infinite glory of the other side. And never forget that we don't understand the, the, the totality of what glory is. The beauty is part of it. Love is part of it. In a Venn diagram, these things would overlap, right? But glory is something completely, it's not different. It's just something that we, you can never imagine, ever, um, as it turns 3, 3, 3 p.m. Um, I just wanted to point that out. But um, <laughs> glory is what we are signing up for. And, and I'm here to tell everyone, based on my experiences, everybody, not just the people who are been labeled as quote unquote righteous or quote unquote good, everybody is going there. It, 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 from what I've learned on my experiences, we're all going to be okay. Um, yeah. They yeah. say that we, they say like, especially in the course of miracles that we, when we die, we wake up to who we truly are, which yes. is infinite, powerful pieces of God anyway. Yeah. So, um, here, this is how you and I were talking on our conversation before when we were just getting to know each other. And I said that some people like in the conversation of the world, like when we, when we're born and we come here, it's called the earth school. We yeah. come to this experience in order to evolve and grow because when we're on the other side, which people can call heaven, you're calling it glory. There's all kinds of names for it. Um, the going on the other side of the veil, you wake up to our, to our, that we are love and that we are infinite yep. and we are one, we are part of, but we don't get there without if our personal experiences here on earth. And that's why some religions and philosophies believe that we keep coming back. Our souls keep coming back. Did, did God say anything to you about the soul, like the soul is like for, uh, is always live, uh, living. It's just experiencing different lifetimes. Did anything like not, that ever get not clarified? Quite, not directly communicated to me, but, um, it was inferred uh, on my last experience, which was this, uh, January 11th of this, this year, 2024, I had my last ayahuasca experience, um, and wait, wait, does that mean you're hanging up the ayahuasca, ayahuasca hat? Yeah, the the <laughs> legal source that I had um is no more. So Okay. All right. Um, yeah. So so it's that's I don't think that's such a bad thing. At some point no. you gotta come here and live it. Oh, absolutely. You can't yeah, which is you why you're on the podcast sharing it with other people because you want to yeah. spread the word. Now you're an evangelist for God. Yeah, you know, and the God you know, right? Yeah. And so to, to answer your question, though, like I it was in, it was inferred and implied based on my last experience that something like that is going on. What, what I was communicated uh, to or, or what was told to me, the revelation I had 
was that um, and, and it was reflected in my own microcosm example of me seeking answers, right? Um, God showed me that my search for answers was demonstrative of, of all of humankind's search for answers. And, and basically he, he, he told me that we had to leave heaven, like our souls wanted answers and we left paradise to seek those answers. And the narrative is that there's this curse that's been placed upon us and all this terrible stuff and like original sin and this, that, and the other. And that's not what I was communicated at, at all. I, I, what, what was told to me is that God thinks this is awesome. He, he admires the courage for us to literally leave heaven to seek these answers. And he thinks it's beautiful. He, he, he kept saying the struggle is beautiful and he loves the courage and, and the, and the, the beauty of it. And he knows that all of our answers are going to lead us back to him in the first place, but he still loves the, the beauty. It's almost like if you had this dog who is, you know, one of these really super courageous dogs that, you know, the kind that, that run back into the fire to save their, uh, their you know, to it's save like people, pay anybody. Yeah. It's like, we know these, these dogs are maybe a little misguided or whatever, but we just love them so much. And that that's kind of the, the idea that I got. It's like, God was like, Hey, you guys want your answers? Okay, I think that's great. Go, go get your answers. I'm going to send you help along the way, um, and it's going to be rough, but you guys had the courage to do this. Right. And so, and our God, our God is big. Your God and my God needs to be big enough to handle any questions. <laughs> you know, oh, like yeah. if your God can't handle you asking questions, you need a bigger God. Yeah. You know, but the I do God think of your understanding. Yeah, but I do think God wants us to figure stuff out ourselves, right? And I think that there are some questions that we that we might ask that are so cosmically beyond us that it's it's better told either through parable or through experience, right? It's like, hey, you want to understand how the you know amplitohedron you know uh, uh, works and calculates and creates all 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 of the subatomic particles and forces underneath it? It's like you either go do all the physics and stuff you, you could possibly imagine, which is unprovable. Like we can't even prove that the amplitohedron is real. It's like, and there's stuff even beyond that. It's like, this is stuff that if you were to try to break it down scientifically is impossible. Right. And so there's stuff that we will, based on the limited physiology of our brains and stuff like, and even the fact that our brains are only three dimensional, there's stuff that we're just never going to know. And so it's, it's kind of like, I don't know. Uh, in spiritual, in spirit form, we would understand, but we need to we need to shed this existence in order to do so, and that's kind of the the, the point. But, but I, I think that God, even in the spirit form up there or whatever, I think that when we when we talk about we are, I have this battle with with the New Age mystics and stuff like that, and a lot of people who do psych psychedelics, they, they they come back and say stuff like we are God, and it's like. I get it. You know, we, we all have the, the divine within us. And the way I look at it is there, you know, we are uh, streams and estuaries that flow into a river and then that river flows into the ocean and the ocean is God. Now we, it's all water, right? We, we, we all, you know, have that water in us, but a stream can't like the, the, the uh, Buffalo Bayou over here can't call itself the Marianas Trench. Right there, there are wonders in the Marianas Trench that are so far beyond rec uh, comprehension, and so the concentration of that is God. So, I think that we are God in so far as we have the water in us, but I don't think that makes us the God. I, I also think, I also think that if we look at this from a f it, with the analogy of light, it's like a pinhole camera. Right is is you can think of it like a camera obscura. Like camera obscuras were invented like back in the 13 or 1400s. It's basically you just take a room and you poke a hole in that room, and the light goes through and it it uh, forms a, a reflected the upside down image of whatever's on the outside wall, you know. So that's it's a basic. I have a camera, camera like that. It's like called a brownie. Yeah, there you go. And so, what 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 can we learn from that and from that? Right, it's like hey. The, the, the light that's out there, I can see it in here. It's upside down and flipped over right, or whatever, but I can use a mirror and stuff and flip it right side up, right? It's a perfect image, basically, of what's out there. But is, is, it, is, is that image really what is out there? And the answer is no. It's like 
not all the photons from that light were able to make it through the hole and get into that room. But the, but the light is still the light. The source, right? like the source. Yeah. So we are, I think that we are camera obscuras of God. Like there's the act, there's the actual light itself, which is a, basically a hologram. And this is why a camera obscura works. It's like that image exists in any little point. The image of everything exists in any single point of light anywhere in existence. Right. But if you take something and you focus that light and force it through something, then it, you know, you see the, the, the focused image. And I think that's what we are is we are camera obscuras of the infinite light that is God. Does that yeah. make us God kind of like we share in the light, but we're not the source of light. I, and, I believe it more like um, God is like the ocean. Like if the whole globe was just water and God is the ocean we are a drop in the ocean. So yep. we have God in us. Yep. Um, and, and as the drop goes on a journey, like the drop becomes the atmosphere and, you know, sucked up for to be rain a drop again and drop back in the ocean, you know, like we're yeah. all, it's always God, but we're an individual drop of God. That's just how I see it. Perfectly personally. put. Yeah. So let's, okay, you're the longest podcast episode I've ever recorded. So it's Sorry about one that. hour and 50, don't apologize. I, I'm the director here. <laughs> <laughs> I could have directed you differently, but I'm directing you now, which is let's let everyone know how, if they, if they enjoyed this conversation, well, by the way, are you like wrapped up with what you wanted to express about God? Like, are we done? Yeah. I think, okay, I, think, I think so. I think, I think so are. too. Yeah. yeah. So if you want more of Andrew and this type of conversation, he has a whole podcast where he does it. So um, where can they find it? Or do they have to go to your website? Like, are you hidden? Like, what's no. the story of this? You can find it. It's a, it's, it's a made up word. It's a long story as to why the, it's my journey through the Pantheos. A lot uh -huh. of people, a lot of people think Pantheon, or there is a word actually called Pathios, and that's the word I intended it for it to really be. But by mistake, I, I've landed on uh, Pantheos. So if you go and look in any um, of the major podcast platforms or YouTube, I would re actually recommend YouTube because I get a lot of engagement there. People can leave comments and I can have discussions with people and such. Uh -huh. um, but just get on any a major pod podcast platform or YouTube and type in my journey through the Pantheos. And there's, I think we have 40 episodes at this point. Um, the, the, as you said, there is so much more y'all. So this is to, to this. Uh, yeah. So if this more. is your thing, if this is your thing and listening to Andrew describe all his different adventures and stuff, um, that's where you want to go. And when he says all the major, that's, Apple podcast, that's yep. Spotify. Yep. Um, I think Google podcast is going away, but you're probably on there too. Are you on iHeartRadio? I believe so. Yeah. yeah. I'm so are yeah. So he's on all the major ones like I am um as well. So um so that's how you find him. And um yeah, go feel free to comment below on our episode on the oneness junkie podcast. I'm actually um, appreciative that you decided to make the oneness junkie podcast your first. <laughs> I'm so thrilled. Yes. Like I'm so I've, I've been wanting to be on a podcast and I appreciate you for, for showing the love and support. It's so awesome. Like this, the community of oneness is a real thing, y'all. It is y'all. It's a real thing out there. And, um, we want to hear about how, what you tell it, comment below, on your experience of God, who is God for you? Where, how have you, has, how has God shown up in your life? And that could go from a very uh, religious, you know, evangelical experience of God all the way to an ayahuasca experience of God. You know, there's yeah. all kinds of ways to experience God, right? Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. I have my own as well. So Anyway, thank you for being here today, Andrew. So fun having thank you, you for have having this me. conversation. Yeah. And um, we wish you all the best on your journey. And um, I don't know what else. In, in love and oneness, we say goodbye. There you go. 
All right. Thank you. Hang in there. I'm going to turn off the recording for the audience. Okay. Sounds Bye, good. everyone. Bye. We've reached the end of this episode. If you'd like to continue with this inspirational journey, be sure to subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss out. If you are a self-proclaimed oneness junkie, get yourself a t-shirt and spread the message of oneness in your community. And finally, if you have a story to share or know someone that should be a guest on this podcast, contact us at onenessjunkie.com. See you next time. And remember, when we heal ourselves, we heal the world. Compassion starts with you and me.